Welcome to Leadership Reimagined, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. I'm Janice Elig, the CEO and founder of Elig Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search through our longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. On today's topic, a culture carrier for a global courier, I am delighted to welcome Carol Tomei, Chief Executive Officer and Director of UPS. She is the 12th CEO in the 150-year history of one of the world's largest shipping couriers. Prior to UPS, as CEO in 2020, Carol served as Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Home Depot, a company she joined in 1995. Prior to Home Depot, Carol was at Riverwood International, United Bank of Denver, now Wells Fargo, and Johns Manville Corporation. Carol was named twice to the Forbes list of the world's most powerful women and among the top 50 most powerful women in business by Fortune magazine. She is very busy these days, and we're going to talk about that. So, Carol, thank you so much. I'm delighted you could join us today. Well, Janice, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you. So, you are the first woman to run UPS in its 115-year history, and a leader who was not an insider. You became CEO during the pandemic and you've repeatedly been praised for the dynamic changes you've made during very challenging times. I understand you took the helm with the intent of, and I quote, changing the business model to unleash revenue and profits and to develop your nearly 550,000 workforce to reach their highest potential. Coming into this role during the pandemic, what was your strategy around this business model about culture and growth? Well, Janice, it was so interesting to onboard during the beginning of the pandemic because what I thought I would be doing didn't happen. I thought I would be traveling the world, meeting UPSers, meeting our customers, uh, spending time with our communities in which we serve. But the world shut down. And then instead, it was a mad dash to make sure that UPSers would stay essential because we knew we had to deliver products to the world as they were sheltering in place. And candidly, we weren't ready for that. We didn't have all the masks and hand sanitizers and, and gloves and, and just the, the operating procedures necessary to make sure our people were safe and that we could take care of our customers. So we scrambled about and we got all of that put together so that we could continue to take care of our customers. And I had the opportunity, rather than traveling the world, to spend time with people one-on-one. -on -one. And that allowed me to get into the heart and the soul of our company in a way that I hadn't done before as a director. It enabled me to go deep into our business model and to see the levers that we could start to turn to actually unleash the revenue and the profits and the culture. So I was very blessed in many ways that I onboarded during a pandemic because I was able to study the company, get to know our people, and bring strategic clarity to our business. And I had an amazing team of leaders that supported me in that effort. And we really operationalized our strategic platform of customer-first, people-led, innovation-driven. And we did that under a theme of better, not better bigger. And what that meant is that we were going to lean into the parts of the market that really valued our end-to-end -end network, that we were going to shed businesses that were value-destroying, that we were going to unleash the power of our more than 500,000 people by focusing on making UPS the best place to work. And I will say now, after two years of serving in this role for this amazing company, we've actually done a lot. <laughs> We've delivered the highest revenues and profits in our customer history, and our likelihood to recommend score is the highest it's ever been. That's incredible. So those revenues have really increased. You took a challenge during the pandemic and turned it into an opportunity by getting closer to your employees. Now, you've got half a million employees, and you are handling over 25 million packages a day. These numbers are daunting. And you've talked about the company and harmonizing the workforce to be one UPS with union and non-union workers. So how do you make that magic happen? I mean, 
I'm always going to the UPS store to send something and, and I know what's going to get there, you know, so I know that the quality is going to be there. How do you make that happen, Carol? Well, first, thank you for your business. We very much appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> you know, 7% of all of our volume starts at a UPS store. Isn't that cool? It, those stores are super important uh, to us. In, in terms of your question, how do you mobilize a company of scale? Because we are a company of scale. We deliver packages in more than 220 countries and territories around the world every day. The way you do it is to land on purpose. We knew what we did. You called it out. We deliver 25 million packages a day. That's what we do. But we hadn't declared our why. So early on in my tenure, we put together a cross-functional team of UPSers and challenged them with our why help us define our why. So they did a masterful job of interviewing uh, UPSers, retirees, customers, communities, and brought back, you know, themes of our why, our purpose. And we iterated and iterated, and we finally landed on our purpose. And I'll share that with you now. It's moving our world forward by delivering what matters. And no matter what position or role you have at UPS, you know what that means? Because you can unpack that in so many different ways. It's not just about moving goods. It's about doing good too. And that rallying cry, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty simple, not very many words, but it's a rallying cry that all UPSers can get their head around. That's amazing. Love that purpose statement because, and that one UPS, but moving our world forward by delivering what matters. Because I understand too, you were, you were interviewed on CNBC recently and talked about like during the holiday season, the corporate office was out there helping on the front line. Is that true? Yeah, that is true. And in fact, I, I believe in servant leadership. I think that's what we're all about. You know, we're not here for us. We're here for the men and women who are delivering packages for our customers. So during the holiday season, we were all out delivering packages. And I'll tell you what, it's <laughs> hard work. It is. I did really well, Janice. I, I, I did really well until my very last delivery. And <laughs> UPSers, they, we park our package cars on the street and then we walk up um, the driveways to the home. And my last delivery stop was a home on a hill. Okay, fine. I can walk up a hill, but it was seven cases of wine. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I need some help. I had to call in some reinforcements to get that those packages delivered. Oh, that's amazing. I love that picture. So now when I go to UPS this holiday season with all my goodies and they look like Santa Claus, I know that Carol will be there as well as all of her employees. I, I sure. will be there. Yeah. I will be there. You know, it, it's interesting because you had a 24-year career at Home Depot, uh, most recently as CFO, and you were a director of UPS since 2003, so you knew the company. But when you were tapped to take on that CEO role, again, a company you knew very well, it was your first CEO role. And you had to come out of a brief retirement, but you said that this role was your calling. What did you mean by that? Well, I, I had an amazing career prior to my retirement, most of it at Home Depot. And what an experience that was. You know, I started when the company had just 400 stores and $14 billion. And now, goodness gracious, it's almost 3,000 stores and hundreds of billions of dollars. It's an amazing company. And I learned so much. But I had re retired and I was out on my farm, enjoying my farm. We had stood up a family foundation with my husband and I was doing a lot of board work, uh, UPS and then other corporate board work. So life was good. But when the UPS was working on their CEO succession plan, uh, they developed a persona of the skills and attributes that the next CEO should possess. And when they matched that persona up against the existing leadership team, they said, well, this is, an, this is a terrific leadership team, but no one really possesses this, this, this persona. No one looks like this persona. So they said, we're going to go to the outside. And when they said, we're going to the outside, they said, well, Carol, you actually match this persona of the CEO that, uh, uh, that we want to be the next CEO. And I'm like, oh. I do. You don't think I'm too old? I was, I was 62 at the time. I'm like, you don't think I'm too old? Like, no, we don't, we don't think you're too old. I'm like, huh. 
So I really reflected on why I would come out of retirement to, to do this. And there were a few reasons. The first, I really do like to create value. When I was CFO at the Home Depot, the shareholder value creation under my tenure was 450%. So I really love to create value. And the stock had been flat here for about six years. And I'm like, gosh, if I get inside of the company, if I get off the board and inside of the company, I think I can figure out the levers to turn to create value. And wouldn't that be fun? So that was a that was a calling for me. The other thing I like to do, and I like to do this more than create value, is I like to develop people. I love to de develop people. I've lost count of the number of people who worked for me who are now CFOs of publicly traded companies. I think it's more than 16. I also have people who work for me who are CEOs of publicly traded companies, including Ted Decker, who's the CEO of Home Depot, and Hal Lawton, who's the CEO of Tractor Supply, and the list goes on and on. I love to develop people. So I'm like, gosh, if I got into this company, I could really develop people. Wouldn't that be fun? And then Janice, I talked to my husband. Um, we're married now nearly 40 years. And I said to Ramon, I said, what do you think? What do you think about me going back to work? And he said, would you please go back to work? You are driving me crazy. So, <laughs> so I had his support, which is really important. You know that old saying, I married you for life, but not for lunch? That was really <laughs> turning out to be true in my, in my life. So I had his support. And really, I was incredibly blessed um, that the, the board asked me to, to come on board. It's It's been an amazing experience. I love what you had to say about yourself. But now I look at your board. It is quite diverse. I look at your executive committee, your team, it's very diverse by age, by ethnicity, by backgrounds, by gender. How did this come about? Because I, I know uh, your numbers right now are quite high, nearly 50% of women on the board, but you've got a diverse board beyond that. And you made some of that happen. So why is this important to you? And since you've been on the board so many years, how has that diversity enhancement, increase the dialogue and the conversation around the boardroom table? Timing is everything. And when I was onboarding as CEO, we had an opportunity to remake the board um, because of retirements due to age or people leaving the board do um, business conflicts. So I was able to bring in five new board directors, um, women and people of color, which was extraordinarily exciting. And as important, we brought diversity of experience and we dropped the age. And that was important because you think of UPS as being a shipping company, we're really morphing into a technology company. And so having people who are contemporaneous in the world of technology was really important to me. The dialogue of the boardroom has changed a lot over the years. Early days, I can remember us talking about people not fastening their seatbelt on the floor of, a, of one of our um, hubs or our packaging centers. We don't talk about seatbelt fastening anymore. We talk about digital fluency. We talked about frictionless and seamless experiences. We talk about moving all of our technology off of our mainframe and into the cloud. I mean, we talk very differently today. We always talk, though, about culture and about the importance of people, and that doesn't change. Those values were instilled in us by our founder, Jim Casey, now 115 years ago. So the, the core of the company, our, you know, our secret sauce, our values, that doesn't change. But the nature of what we talk about at the board, the nature of what we talk about as a leadership team is really different. You know, I'm putting what I call the top of the house, the top 150 leaders of our company through a two-week training program in partnership with Emory University here in Atlanta, Georgia, to increase our digital fluency. Um, because we must, we must. You know, I wasn't bo born with a cell phone in my mouth, <laughs> like a lot of all the kids are today. <laughs> but we, we've got to increase our digital fluency because everything is moving to a simple frictionless experience and commerce is being conducted on a phone. And if we don't have that experience for our customers, we'll get left behind. So I'm, I'm super excited about what we're, what we're doing in that space. And our board and our leadership team is, is all in. Well, what you're doing too, in terms of educating your board to can go forward in the future for the company and educating your leadership team and to hear the number of people who have reported to you in the past who are now in higher level positions as CEOs and such is a remarkable legacy, a remarkable legacy. 
in terms of what you're doing to develop people. So how do you do that now in terms of training and developing the frontline workers? What do they have to look forward to in terms of moving up at UPS? So important, um, particularly in this environment, as you know, because there's a war on talent. It's, it's so important. You know, we in our frontline, for our frontline um, UPSers, I would say these aren't jobs, these are careers. You can start with us as a part-time seasonal worker and end up running the company. I mean, this is an amazing company that creates careers within the same company. So many people I talk to have had 10 different jobs around the world. So we invest in people's ability to grow their career. We have a number of different development programs. Um, we've just kicked off a brand new leadership development program for our part-time supervisors, which I'm super excited about. There are about 38,000 of them in the United States, and we're training all of them on leadership because the soft skills are as important as the technical skills. So that's an, a, a way we keep people engaged is by investing in them. And oh, by the way, our jobs are high paying jobs. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a motivation too, right? right Get into right. the family because you can make a good living for your family. And with the stock, given your earnings, right? Yes. Yes, indeed. Talk to me about the earnings and how, how that has grown over the years since you, you know, say the last three, four years. And since you've been the CEO, so we've we've done a, a number of things. Um, we identified the markets that we wanted to serve that value our end to end uh, network and leaned heavily into those markets. One of those being small and medium sized businesses. Before I joined the company, we had lost share in that segment for seven years in a row. When I onboarded, I, I'm like, well, what's getting in the way? Why can't we gain share in this segment? Because it's a very profitable uh, segment. And I was told, well, we don't have the fastest ground time. Um, we get beat when it comes to time and transit. And I'm like, well, what is, what's going to take to fix that? And they're like, well, money. I'm like, we have money. Let's do, let's invest in that. So we pulled the investment forward, uh, delivered it gosh, nine months ahead of time. And as soon as we improved our time in transit, we started to gain share. We've gained share in that segment every quarter since then, every single quarter. Our SMB uh, penetration will be about 30% this, this year. So really pleased with that. And that certainly helped in terms of the revenue quality coming into our business. We've also looked at productivity differently, not as a one and done but actually as a virtuous cycle. And productivity for us is simply measured by packages per hour. And so by using investing in automation and technology and in methods, we are improving the packages per hour or the productivity of our business. Uh, we are also very disciplined on how we allocate capital. We had been a bit of adventurous when it came to capital allocation. Now we're very strategic, very disciplined, and those are showing in, uh, in great results. Our return on invested capital increased 900 basis points last year from what it had been the prior year. So, yep. So wow. uh, the team's doing a really nice job of, of driving um, value here. That's an impressive statistic. Um, thank you, Carol. And now a quick reminder to our audience. Our topic today is a culture carrier for a global courier. And we're speaking with Carol Tomei, CEO and director of UPS. The topics we cover like today's are all current and a new topic with a new game changer is released every month. This is a great way to stay current on relevant issues happening around us. Now let's return to Carol Tomei. So, Carol, I, I, I recently read that you are going to be carbon neutral by 2050, an extraordinary goal needed by most companies. What does it mean and what do you need to do to be carbon neutral? As you will appreciate, we are greenhouse gas hogs. We drive a lot of vehicles. We fly a lot of planes. In fact, we emit over 35 million metric tons of greenhouse gas every year. So our commitment is by 2050 that we will be carbon neutral. In other words, we will reduce our carbon emissions or we will deploy carbon offsets that help us reach that carbon neutral goal. We've already started. We have, for example, a rolling laboratory of vehicles that are powered by alternative fuel. Think about electric vehicles 
or vehicles that are powered by compressed natural gas. We have started to change how we power our buildings by powering our buildings with renewable energy. For example, we have two data centers that power our network. Uh, those are now powered by renewable energy. To put that into perspective, that's the equivalent, the amount of electricity necessary to power 5,000 homes. So we have put out um, goals along the way to 2050 to, to drive down um, our carbon emissions, and we'll report on that every year. But we think it's not only good for business, it's good for the planet. That is absolutely true. And I think every company needs to be doing a lot of what you're doing. Do you see any obstacles in your way or anything that will throw off that target year? Yeah. The, the long pole in the tent is sustainable aviation fuel. We fly about 600 planes every day. And there is not enough sustainable aviation fuel available in the market today. So we were going to have to work with the airline industry, and we are, and the manufacturers of alternative fuels, and we are, to get a solution. And this isn't just a problem for UPS, it's a problem for anybody who's flying a plane. Now, here's an exciting thing when it comes to aviation. Uh, we are working with a company called Beta Technologies, and we'll take um, our first what we call electric vertical and takeoff landing aircraft. We'll take delivery of that um, aircraft in two 2024. This is actually a plane. It's a cargo plane powered by a battery. Now, it doesn't carry a lot of cargo and certainly can't fly across the ocean, but it could be a feeder aircraft. So if you think about small feeder aircraft that are flying around the country, helping us move packages around the country, we could replace all that aircraft with this electric aircraft. So we're super excited about that. That's so exciting. So much to come, right? So I want to turn a little bit to you and your background. And I know you were recently interviewed and you referenced a photograph your sister showed you that you never seen before. It was four generations of women in your family, your great grandmother, grandmother, mother, and you as a baby. So when you, what went through your mind, Carol, when seeing these four generations and what do you think these women would say of you today? Well, it, it was just such a, such a special moment looking at that photo because I knew my great grandmother as a little girl, but what I didn't know about her until I was an older person is that she was a wagon train homesteader. Um, at a time when women couldn't even vote in this country. So as I looked at that photo and I looked at my great grandmother to me as a baby, four generations, I'm like, wow. You know, we say women haven't come very far. We've come all long, long way in four generations. And we're just getting started in, in so many ways. And I think what my, my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother would say to me, because they told me this when I was a girl, you can do anything. And you can be anything. That's so wonderful that you remember that about your great grandmother. And so if she could see you today, um, wouldn't she be so proud, right? She would be. And her hair, white as snow. And parts <laughs> of my hair are white. So I'm keeping, it's gray, mostly gray, but parts of it are white. So I'm like, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll have her hair one day. So Carol, as other women, you know, try to move up into the C-suite and to the CEO role, and you're one of less than, I think now, 40, 40 or 45 women in that role. Um, did you have a career path or design in mind? Was it the influence of individuals in your family, the influence of others? What brought you to where you are today? And then what would be your advice to women who seek to, to move up that corporate ladder? Never in my wildest imagination did I think I'd be doing this. Never. Um, I started as a, as a banker. I really wanted to work for my dad, who was a community banker in Jackson, Wyoming. I don't know if you know Jackson, Wyoming. It's a beautiful place. So I, I, wanted to, I wanted to work for him, and I wanted to take over his bank when he retired. That's what I wanted to do. But, well, you know, my, my dad called me my last year of school and said, well, I got some news from you. I'm divorcing your mom, and I'm selling the bank. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> that, there goes that, <laughs> that aspiration. So I, I, I'm like, all right, I'll be a banker. So I was a banker um, in the West um, and then decided to maybe that I wanted to grow my corporate finance knowledge and experience base and wanted to own something because bankers don't really own anything. They just work on deals. And I wanted to actually put my fingers and own something. So I 
left banking and went to work for one of my clients who was in chapter 11 and helped them consummate their plan of reorganization. And then I ended up taking a company public through an IPO. And then that brought me to Atlanta, which then got me into Home Depot. And I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, this, this, my career is just going in ways I had never thought it would go. And I'm like, I still, I love finance. So I was the, a treasurer for a long time. Then I became CFO and I'm like, I'm loving this. I'm loving, loving finance. But I kept getting opportunities to do different things. And my toolkit just kept getting expanded. So I was running strategy and I was running, running IT. And I, I'm like, I love to develop people. And I'm like, hey, maybe I could be a CEO. Maybe I could be, right? <laughs> I did, never planned it. Never, never planned it. But I'm like, well, I, maybe I could be. And so actually, back in 2014, I was one of three people who were being considered as a CEO replacement for Frank Blake, who was the CEO of Home Depot. And he was retiring and he had three people the board was looking at. I was one. I didn't get it. And the guy who got it was fantastic. Craig Manier is fantastic. You know, I ended up working for Craig until um, I le- until I retired in 2019 because he was a great, great CEO. And I learned through that experience too. I'm like, it wasn't my time, right? It wasn't my time. Don't, don't get overly anxious because there's a, you know, I think God has a plan for us. Don't get over anxious for it. Let your career happen. Because had I taken, if I had gotten that job, I wouldn't have gotten this job. And this is why I'm here. I am here for UBS. So, you know, just don't be too planful is my advice and let your career go. You did. You were patient, but you were always out there. It sounds like you were asking a lot of questions too as a board member. So that must have been part of that, which said, this is a leader who will ask a lot of questions and move the needle for UPS. But you had changed industries. Was this difficult for you in terms of the, you know, go from banking to retail to transportation and really, a, you know, a tech company now as well? Is that a challenge for people when they do that? There are more similarities between retail and a, a courier like a UPS than you might imagine. And think about who our customers are. Our customers are all the large retailers. So I just kind of flipped you know, I was on one side of the equation. Now I'm on the other side of the equation. And it's actually extraordinarily helpful for me because I understand how the retailers are thinking. I really do. I understand how they are thinking about moving, the, you know, upstream, downstream logistics. I get it. Because that's what I did for so long. So I, it wasn't that hard of a transition for me. And on the IT front, I did run IT for a while. So it wasn't like I was walking in um without that experience. Right. You, you, you knew this company. But besides your roles as an executive in the corporate world, you served on the Federal Reserve Board of Atlanta, right? The International Business Council of the World Economic Forum, and on the Verizon Board, just to name a few, as well as being honored by Forbes and Wall Street Journal and Fortune. So these experiences sound like they also added to what you're doing today. Is that what you have found in terms of all these experiences leading up to your role as CEO of UPS? Without a doubt. I'm incredibly blessed um, that I've had lots of experiences. You know, I started working back in 1981. So my personal toolkit is really full of tools that I've, you know, built along the way. So when I need to, to, you know, pull out a tool, I can. You know, here we are um, facing incredible inflation in the United States. I'm like, huh, when I started working back in 1981, it was highly inflationary. In fact, the interest rates were double digit back then. Right. And I remember exactly what we did to manage through a highly inflationary market. When I was on the Federal Reserve Board of um, Atlanta, it was during the financial crisis. So I was going up and meeting with Ben Bernanke and that whole team during the whole crisis. So when we you know, ha- ha- went through the recent pandemic crisis, I'm like, huh, I know how to manage through this because I've already gone through this once before. So I just go into my toolkit. It may not be exactly the same experience, but there are enough similarities that it can help manage through through whatever comes our way. And then, of course, I don't lean on my own intuition or my own tools. I, I leverage the power of an incredible team. Well, you have an extraordinary team next to you, don't you? So, I do. Carol, you um, are the recipient of this year's Four Pillar Award for your outstanding leadership. So for our audience listening, men and women, what advice do you have for others in terms of similar aspirations, um, how to overcome adversity? Maybe they haven't seen the movie quite played this way before as you have. Uh, how to get to that next level? What advice do you have for them? I always go to Maya Angelou, who's my favorite poet, and she said, don't make money your goal, 
Instead, do what you love and do it so well that people can't take their eyes off of you. And so I, I think that's the first place to start is do what you love and do it so well that people can't take their eyes off of you. The second place, though, is to don't aspire, but rather serve. You know, I'm a big believer in servant leadership. And if you put people in front of you, if you put them ahead of you, if you are there to serve them, it's amazing what comes back at you. It comes back at you in waves, like tidal waves, like stop, stop. You know, I'm just here for you. But what comes back at you is pretty amazing. You know, when you listen to those frontline workers, you you do really get what's going on. I'm sure you've listened to them and seen, oh my goodness, we didn't see that problem before. Now I know how we can correct it. Has that been part of your listening that you've done as a CEO? I, I listen a lot. Um, I read all my emails. No one scans any of my emails. So I and people are really great. Uh, UPSers and customers <laughs> are really great at sending me notes. And it's very <laughs> helpful. No, it's, it's extraordinarily helpful. Because rather than poo-pooing what they say, I'm like, let's go check this out. And oftentimes, we find we have an opportunity. And when I go out to one of our, our package centers or one of our hubs, I don't take a list, a list of things they need to do. I bring back a list with me of things we need to do for them. And I'll just sit at the table with our part-time soups or our drivers or whomever's willing to spend time with me and listen to them. And they'll tell me. They say, you know, I, this fan isn't working. I need, you know, they'll go through the list. And I'm like, yep, I, I, I got it. And we can, we can a, a address this. And sometimes we can't, but oftentimes we can. You know, one of the biggest issues facing our country is available childcare for working parents, particularly working women. And I'm like, okay, what can we do? So we're going to pilot. We're going to pilot two child care uh, centers in 23. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to go, but we're going to pilot it for our working people because I think this, this could be transformative if we can figure this out. I love it. Any parting words for our audience, including, you know, I, I loved what you said in the beginning with your, you've got a great partner, your husband, in terms of saying, you know, uh, go do what you love, do it. You know, you do need the support of people around you, your partners in life, your advisors. Um, and the, the finding your calling, loving what you do. Is there anything else that you would give our audience as parting words? Yeah, the, the thing I would add, Janice, is the power of purpose. It's been a rallying cry for our company, moving our world forward by delivering what matters. And as leaders, I think we need to focus on our personal purpose. And for me, I, I, I've really reflected on this a lot during my tenure here at UPS. And I've landed on this for my purpose. And it, it really keeps me centered in this really crazy world. My purpose keeps me centered. And it's, I'll share it with you, it's lead to inspire, serve to create, give to remain. And, you know, I can recite those words even at three o'clock in the morning when I'm worried about something. I'm like, this is why you're doing it. This is why you're doing it. And I just get up and go, right? I, I, don't, I, I don't get too stressed out. I just get up and go because I know why I'm doing it. That why is really important. So, Carol, say those words again. I lead to inspire. I serve to create. I give to remain. Well, I'm going to start my weeks with those words. That is living a purpose-driven life and being a servant leader and so inspiring to your UPS um, associates and your staff and your board. You really are an impressive leader, Carol Tomei, and I thank you for the time that you've spent with us today and the words of wisdom. And I look forward to having you come to New York City and we're gonna go to some UPS stores together and I'll show you some of my favorite ones. Awesome, that'd be great, Janice. <laughs> Thanks so much for your conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Carol, again, for joining us today and sharing an incredible story and the growth of UPS is so impressive. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in to another game-changing conversation on Leadership Reimagined. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit our website at ellengroup.com. Thank you for joining us today with Carol Tomei, CEO and Director of UPS.